Korea is famous for its day spas, dermatologists, and plastic surgery clinics, thanks to a wide variety of treatments they offer that aren't available overseas. But the other thing they have in common is their use of clinical Korean skincare brands, the type of products you'll usually only find at an esthetician. Today, we're going to explore what they are, how they're different, and some of the top trending clinical Korean brands. Welcome to The Korean Beauty Show, where we're talking all things Korean skincare, makeup, and more. If you want to learn about the hottest trending products and ingredients straight from South Korea, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, we'll be diving in to take a look at the latest trends, as well as all the tips and tricks you need to perfect your K-beauty routine. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, professional K-beauty expert and founder of Korean beauty platform Style Story. Today's episode is brought to you by Style Story, your go-to for K-beauty. Shop online at stylestory.com.au and discover unique brands you won't find anywhere else, plus cheap international shipping. Hello and welcome back. We're here for another episode of the Korean Beauty Show podcast. I am your host, Lauren Lee. I am a long-term resident of South Korea. For those of you who haven't already met me, I have been living here now since 2016. Uh, So I think I'm well into my fifth year consecutively of living here, but it has been This year marks 10 years since the first time I ever came to Korea, which started my journey into K-beauty, into my business, into running Style Story, launching my skincare brand Jelly Co, and a whole lot of other things. So 10 years it has been for me. If you are coming back to join us for another week, then of course, welcome. I am so happy to see you here again, virtually. (laughs) Uh, So today I'm going to be running through something a little bit different, and that is the clinical skincare brands. Uh, So rather than the the types of products that we usually talk about, which are the kind of things that you can, you know, buy online, online malls and things like that. These are the kind of things that usually you will find in a Korean clinic. So in a clinical setting of some type of some type, some of the products are available direct to consumer as well. So I will run through those. But first up for another segment of K-Beauty News headlines. So Amore Pacific published the results on the skin of wearing a COVID face mask for a day. And I thought this was really, really interesting. So I will caveat this, that this is not a recent news headline. I found this in my digging around and actually they published the results last year, but I thought it was quite topical because there are a lot of us out there that are still wearing masks. I know in some countries, their vaccination schedules are really sort of moving along and everyone's getting vaccinated. And some people have been now allowed to take their masks off. Uh, And Korea is moving towards that as well. But for the time being, masks are still mandatory. Uh, I think I read in the paper the other day that they are saying as a benefit to encourage people to get vaccinated, that they will allow people who have received their full doses of vaccinations to walk around outside without their masks on and to, you know, gather with their family in greater numbers because at the moment we're under restrictions as to how many people can gather. Uh, But I know in a lot of other countries that are not as uh, moving as quickly as, for example, the States, that everyone is still in masks. So I thought this result, the the results that Amore Pacific published are going to still be quite topical for uh, the time being. So I'm going to let you know what the results were. So what they did is they had their Research Institute of Technology. So Amore Pacific is one of the really big uh, conglomerates in K-beauty, I would say one of the top two. And they have research institutes of their own that can go out and, you know, explore all kinds of different uh topics, I guess, that about how things affect the skin uh, and the performance of certain cosmetics on the skin. Like it's a huge, huge company. So this is one of their research arms. 
And they published results on their research into the effects of wearing a COVID mask and what that does to the skin. So you can find it. It's in an international journal called Skin Research and Technology. So I think before they did this research, a lot of people assumed that the inside, the area of where you're wearing the mask would actually be moistened because there's humidity trapped in the mask. So it kind of makes sense that, okay, it's going to be more humid in there, so it's it's going to be more uh, moisturized. But the study confirmed that it basically does the opposite and it dries that area out. And they have come to the conclusion that this was caused by the breath being heated by the body temperature and then being sealed in by the effects of the mask. So what they actually found was that after wearing a mask, redness on the skin becomes much more pronounced on the cheeks and the perioral area as well. So and that those areas also are recording lower levels of hydration. So they found that sebum secretion, so this is oil in the glands, was more prominent on the forehead, the cheeks, the chin and the perioral area while wearing a mask and transepidermal water loss was also measured. So what their study concluded was that even though wearing a mask is obviously essential for stopping the spread of the virus, that skin placed in this mask wearing environment really needs proper moisturization and a lot of soothing care. Uh, And they also noted that skin drying can lead to aging, including a reduction in elasticity and the appearance of wrinkles. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, Obviously, I have long had my suspicions that wearing masks is causing a whole lot of different uh, skin issues for lots of people. I myself have had dermatitis on and off for six months. I had a really bad case of mask knee last year, a really terrible case of it. Uh, So I think in general, wearing a mask, most people that have been wearing one for a long time will tell you that their skin is not the best um, that it, that it, that it normally is. It's, it's experiencing a lot of different symptoms and things like that. So this study sort of backed that up. So I thought that was really interesting. I believe that was published in November last year. So it's not exactly like this week's news, but regardless, we haven't spoken about it. I thought it was interesting. So I thought I might as well just throw it in there. So that is, uh, our K beauty news for this week. And on to the meat and potatoes of this week's episode. So talking about clinical Korean skincare. So this is a question I get asked occasionally on Instagram, you know, what are the the aestheticians brands and what is used in like the skin clinics and stuff like that here. And also another really common question is, well, what differentiates clinical Korean skincare brands from ordinary Korean skincare brands. And I think that's a good place to start. So a couple of things, I think. The first thing, the first big difference is where they're stocked. So skin clinics and plastic surgery clinics are usually the ones that will stock the Korean clinical brands as opposed to like the um, direct to consumer and the online sites, which usually just stock the ordinary skincare brands. I'm using air quotes for that. (laughs) So the other big thing is price. The clinical brands are much more expensive. I would say at, at an estimate two to three times the price of the road store brands. Uh, the ingredients are also different. Now, they, they are different, but I think it's more the focus of them. So the focus of the ingredients that I've noticed in the clinical skincare brands is that it's a really heavy focus on rejuvenating and skin regenerating ingredients. So you will see some similarities, like Sika is a pretty popular one. Centella Asiatica is pretty popular across both. But I think um, some of the brands that I'm going to go into and introduce you guys to, you'll see what I mean. The ingredients are just a little bit more focused on regeneration. And that makes total sense, of course. Like if people are having, you know, a really invasive treatment at a skin clinic or a plastic surgery clinic, then obviously the skin is going to be damaged and they're looking for products that are going to help repair that damage on a cellular level, I guess, rather than just at a surface level. So that's the difference that I see in the ingredients between the clinical brands versus the just general everyday brands. 
The other thing is the patents. A lot of these products will have patents for a special technology that they're using. And then many of them are also registered in Korea as Kinungsang Hwajangpum, which is known in English as functional cosmetics. So these ones are more strictly regulated by the KFDA, and that's because they have the qualities or properties of drugs. So you can think of these as similar to the kinds of things that would be regulated by the TGA in Australia and the FDA in the States. So that tends to be the four big differences is where they're stocked, the price of them, uh, the ingredients, and then any special patents or registrations that they have. Um, you know, that I guess for a lot of these products, they put a lot more research into the technology behind them. That's probably the big difference. So that's how they're different. Now, I thought this might be a good time to sort of just generally chat about how functional cosmetics in Korea are regulated because it is maybe a little bit different to where you're listening from. So the Korean Cosmetics Act is the the piece of legislation that governs cosmetics in Korea and there are different levels of regulation for various cosmetic products. So the special category that is known as functional cosmetics are the ones that are the most strictly regulated and they're the products that make whitening claims or what we call brightening in English. They make wrinkles reducing claims and of course SPF products which I know we've spoken about before so that is probably the most strictly regulated and then there is another category regulated as quasi drugs and they include things like acne improvement uh, products that treat atopic dermatitis atopic dermatitis and then also hair loss prevention so they're regulated slightly differently and they're known as like quasi or quasi drugs so if the product is making claims about cells then they need to undergo a cell efficacy evaluation test uh, and those products include things like um products making claims about collagen expression productivity, tyrosinase activity inhibition, activity inhibition, which is um, for things like pig- pigmentation and melasma, and then also cytotoxicity. So there are lots of different, I guess, streams, you could call it, for how these various different products are regulated in Korea. But that's just sort of a broad brush umbrella as to what we're talking about here. So these are a different level of product than a lot of the ones that you'll see, for example, on our website at Style Story. Um, And that's just because of the types of claims they're making and the types of ingredients they're using and things like that. So in general, there is a distinction and a bit of a difference between the kinds of products that are regulated as drugs or almost drugs and then just regular everyday skincare products. So that is it in a nutshell. Now, I found a review for the podcast on CastBox, which I am going to share with you guys. And the reviewer said, so happy I found this podcast. I'm just dipping my toe into the world of K-beauty. And this podcast is so informative. I love the rundown on ingredients and all the cool innovations in the Korean market. So thank you so much. Um, CastBox was a new one for me. So if you guys are listening through CastBox, feel free to leave your review. I would love to to read it if you have one. So I think the big question most people have about the clinical brands is, well, what are they? Um, And can I get my hands on them? So look, there are so many clinical brands on the market. There are probably, maybe not as many as the regular brands, but there are many, many, many brands. So I've just picked out five uh, and a couple that I've actually had experience with myself when I've gone to a um, a dermatologist. So the first one on my list is a brand called Jenabel. And they create formulas, they say, with a skin soothing effect that are moisturizing with a focus on light application and absorption. So this is, again, one of these kind of brands. They stock them in Korean skin clinics and also the plastic surgery clinics. And the types of ingredients that Jenabel 
Annabelle works with are things like PDRN. So this is a DNA extract ingredient that helps with wound repair. So again, quite different from the kinds of things that you would see in just, you know, your typical, you know, basic skincare products. They also work with peptides, which you can see in quite a lot of K-beauty products, Centella Asiatica, Sika, Alantoin, and also, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this, who Tonia Cordata, which I believe in English we just call heart leaf. So let's just call it heart leaf. So those last few ingredients are ones that you can find in normal uh, products as well. But one of Genevelle's most popular products is their PDRN rejuvenating cream. And that one is aimed at wrinkle reduction and brightening, barrier pair, barrier repair rather, elasticity, calming and repairing. So that is one of the popular brands. Another one is Ultra V and this is actually a biomedical beauty brand. So they create functional cosmetics, which are the types of cosmetics we were just talking about, as well as devices and the threads that they use for thread lifts. So thread lifting is a really popular procedure that uh, has been being used in Korea for a while. It's basically a less invasive version of facelift that uses dissolvable threads or stitches put into the skin to sort of pull everything up. Uh, And I believe that this technology that they have sold it to other clinics in, for example, the States, and and you can now get thread lifting done there. So Ultra V is one of the brands that actually makes these. So their products are stocked in skin clinics and plastic surgery centers. Um, So basically they do the, the full gamut. They do thread lifts, medical equipment, and functional cosmetics. And they have developed a type of thread that lasts for two years once it is inserted, and that is made with PCL and PDO. So PDO thread lift and PCL thread lift. So um, that is a brand that you will see if you go to a Korean um, plastic surgery clinic or skin clinic. Now, another one that I've actually used a range of their products and had them used on me in treatments before is a brand called Histo Lab, and that is a professional esthetician's brand. It's very widely used in Korea and distributed to medical clinics, and they use plant stem cells and a whole heap of other ingredients. One of their most famous products is their Azulan Complex Ample 72. So I had that used on me uh, in a series of treatments that I had at an esthetician's uh, and then I also bought it um, for home use as well and that was a quite an expensive um, ample compared to like the average price of other um, you know comparable Korean cosmetics I think off the top of my head I maybe paid around $80 for it um, so the, again you can see like quite a bit more expensive but that's the kind of Uh, products and brands that you will actually see estheticians using here. So Histolab. Another one that you guys, I know for sure some of you have heard of is Dr. G. So Dr. G has branched out into a direct to consumer brand as well, but they originally started uh, in a skincare clinic setting. So Dr. G, the G stands for Goon Sesang, which means beautiful world. Uh, so that the brand was actually started by the owner of Goon Sesang Pibukwa, and now they have a whole lot of different, like so many products. I literally can't even, like my mind boggles when I see how big their, their catalog is. It's crazy. Um, what they've done is basically they've got a line of products to treat lots of various different skin issues. Um, so just one of the ones, if I had to pick one that's quite popular in Korea, is their Red Blemish Clear Soothing Cream. But Dr. G has many, many popular products. Uh, so that might be a little bit more accessible if you're looking for a brand that you might actually be able to try. Uh, Dr. G is one of those clinical brands. Well, it's a brand that started as a clinical brand. I'd say not all of their products at the moment are strictly clinical. Uh, they're doing a lot more direct to consumer, but that is a brand that you might be able to get your hands on. Another brand, and this was 
probably one of the first brands I think I came into contact with in a dermatological setting was Easy Dew. So Easy Dew is a very famous cosmeceutical brand and they hold patents for lots of different cosmetic technologies and they also sell medical devices. The key ingredient that they are working with is sh oligopeptide one which is also commonly called egf uh, and they also work with a lot of patented ingredients so two of their most popular products domestically are the dw egf moisture synergy ample and then their dw EGF Cream Presome RX. Um, so that one, I remember not long after I'd moved to Korea, I can't remember what the name of the skin clinic was, but I went to a skin clinic and that Easy Dew was the brand that they were stocking there. And I, I, I never forgot that because I was like, oh, wow, okay, cool. Like the brands are different in the skincare clinics. And that's a brand that I see again and again. So they are very popular. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know if you guys are curious about knowing more about the cosmeceutical brands. Obviously, they're not as easy to get your hands on just because a lot of them are only stocked and distributed in medical clinics. But I know um, Star Story, we have um, a consulting branch of our business that, where we actually work with a lot of people in the industry. And that is uh, a common uh, request that we get from clients of ours is to, you know, advise them on what cosmeceutical brands that they can stock in their own clinics. So if you are a clinical skincare um, center owner or, you know, someone that's looking for products like that, please get in touch with our team because that is the kind of thing that we also do is to help put people in, um, you know, find the right brand for you, find the perfect brand for your clinic um, so that you can stock them as well. So if that's something that you're interested in, just get in touch with our team and let us know. Uh, if you're just a consumer, well, I hope that this was still interesting for you. And if it was, don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating so that other people can find us as well. I'm always so grateful when you guys do that and take time out of your busy day. So I'm going to wrap it up here for this week, but I will be back next week and I would love to have you here with me. All right, guys, until next time.